talk. For those of you who haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, just last weekend we opened this exhibit, Blake Little, Photographs yeah. from the Gay Rodeo. Um, so if you have already been, welcome back. If you haven't had a chance to look around yet, please do feel free to stay after the talk. Um, we'll get some students in here to try to get these chairs out of your way so that you can really enjoy the exhibit. And um, I will do our intro now. So it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Ellen Herman. Dr. Herman is a professor of history, the vice provost for academic affairs, and the faculty co-director of the Wayne Morris Center for Law and Politics here at the University of Oregon. Dr. Herman is a historian of the modern United States with special interests in the human sciences, social engineering, and therapeutic culture. This evening, she's here to share with us reflections on Stonewall at 50. Please join me in welcoming Ellen. I don't usually need a lot of amplification, mm -hmm. and let me just add my thanks for being here. I know I'm competing with wine right outside. <laughs> the and I walked through the, the, uh, the lobby of the law school, and there was wine there too. So you must be really interested in Stonewall. <laughs> to mention the Democrats who are doing battle, I think, at, at the moment. Right. And I'll be interested to yeah. sort of see clips um, of that. But, uh, you know, you, I, I'm just here to talk about Stonewall. A lot of you may already know what Stonewall is. If you don't, don't worry, I'll describe it briefly. But there were a lot of celebrations. I mean, the year 1969, you know, there were a lot of things. You may have noticed all of the commemorations of the moon landing, and there are many other things that happened in 1969, but the riots at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village took place in late June of 1969, and this past June, and really extending, I think, into July and over the summer, there were, um, in tandem with all the annual gay pride marches and celebrations, a lot of reflections about that particular moment, 1969. So it was very kind of the museum to invite me here to talk about it in connection with this really interesting show. I was just looking at some of the photographs. I know nothing about gay rodeo, but it's a great example of one of the points that I'm going to make. So let me just start by showing you a picture. This is a photograph of the Stonewall Inn. The Stonewall Inn was a bar. Uh, it's, uh, located in Greenwich Village in New York City. And this photograph was taken like within a month or two of the riots, so in either August or September of 1969. And it's very difficult to see the, the writing that is on the window, but I, I have um, typed it out for you. It says, we homosexuals plead with our people to please help maintain peaceful and quiet conduct on the streets of the village, signed Mattachine. And I'll tell you a little bit, Matt, the Mattachine Society was, was one of the first organizations founded in great secrecy almost 20 years before the Stonewall riots in Los Angeles. And they, the pioneers of the Mattachine Society kind of um, put their faith in a strategy uh, that had to do with respectability and inclusion in kind of ordinary or normal, to use the language of the, the period, American citizenship, and the idea that gay people could be literally rioting outside of a bar in, in Greenwich Village was very upsetting, as you can see, and they, they pleaded um, for uh, calm uh, and peaceful uh, behavior. This is what the riots look like, and usually people say riot, but it was actually a series of confrontations with police that began very early on the morning of June 28, uh, 1969. And the thing to remember about this is that it was a response to a, a, a police raid. Police raids of gay gathering places especially in urban areas and especially bars, were very routine events in the uh, years, uh, decades, really, before uh, this particular riot. And it's important to remember that even in 1969, I think 
think virtually every state in the country had criminal laws on the books, criminalizing homosexual conduct in 1969, not 1869, 1969. Organized medicine, especially psychiatry, also was a source of a, a lot of, 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 of difficulty until 1973, so several years after Stonewall, homosexuality was defi defined as not just a sexual perversion, and perversion was a term that was you know, very commonly used at the time, but as a mental pathology, a mental illness, and it was defined as such in the American Psychiatric Association's Bible of Mental Disorders, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This thing still exists, it's, it's the Bible, it's, it's the way people are diagnosed. So homosexuality was not removed, so the law, organized medicine, religion, many faith communities also um, uh, defined homosexuality uh, not just as perverse but as sinful, and perhaps most poignantly of all, many families uh, at this moment in time, uh, not all families, but many families literally kicked out sons and daughters or other members um, who were bold enough to be honest and open about who they were. So young people now especially find this, you know, so impossible to believe, that's, that's a good thing, <laughs> um, that it's important to just go back and say that. In addition to criminalizing gay um, sexual behavior, New York State had a law on the books that said it was illegal to masquerade as the opposite sex. So cross-dressers, because transgender was not a term that was used in 1969, but cross-dressers who were patrons of the Stonewall Inn, the Stonewall Inn catered really to especially marginalized members of what we now call the LGBTQ community. Transsexuals, uh, male prostitutes, um, drag queens, homeless young people who had been kicked out by their parents and guardians and so on. Um, that is the background behind this kind of uh, photographs. Now, what happened after the, the police arrived at the Stonewall Inn, but rather than just filing into the paddy wagon, as was kind of the habit in these kinds of raids, um, patrons, at this bar started to throw first coins and then bottles at the police. Crowds gathered outside uh, the, um, the inn and the police eventually retreated in part because this was extremely unusual behavior. This kind of militance or what came you know, during the, the early years of the AIDS epidemic to be called acting up, this was not like the standard operating procedure for gay people in 1969. And this, the shock of this kind of reaction is one of the things that marks Stonewall for many people as not just an iconic moment, but as a turning point. You know, there's before Stonewall and there's after Stonewall. Many years ago, there's a wonderful documentary filmmaker whose name I can't remember who made two documentaries. Literally, one was called Before Stonewall, one was called after Stonewall, and I recommend them to you if you haven't seen them because they're wonderful collections of, of narratives and reflections, but I'm using the names just to suggest how clear uh, Stonewall seemed, not just now, you know, in memory, but at the time, it seemed to be a clear turning point, in part because of the change from this kind of behavior of kind of peaceful, calm quest for respectable inclusion to this kind of acting, acting up. So that is um, what happened at Stonewall. And the fact that it was recognized as a turning point right away is seen in this photograph, which took place exactly one year after. Um, June 28th of 1970, was, it was called Gay Liberation at the time, but what this evolved 
into was the annual ritual that most of us are probably familiar with, these celebrations and marches that take place generally in June, although here in Eugene, it seems to be like a picnic that happens in July or August, <laughs> like the church social. That's the, way I, that's the way I think about Eugene, but to celebrate gay pride and gay visibility. And that's the difference um, uh, that Stonewall uh, made initially. Now, why does all of this matter? Um, this image is probably, if, if it's familiar to you, it's familiar to you as a slogan from about 10 to 12 years after Stonewall. The, the um, slogan, Silence Equals Death, was, is associated with the early years of the AIDS epidemic and AIDS activism. But I'm using it here because it summarizes very nicely and in just two words, well three if you count equal, um, the difference between that before and after Stonewall feeling. And the difference uh, was embedded in the kind of Stonewall era and post Stonewall um, uh, years and uh, gay activists their sense of what their movement was about, what they were fighting, and how they should fight it. So this just says what I already told you. But their analysis of what was wrong is that the closet, which was a phrase that uh, symbolized the kind of secrecy, the lies, the shame, the idea that gay people should keep their perversion to themselves, and so on, lest they be subject to all the kinds of penalties that I just described, criminal, medical, religious, familial. The closet was sustained by silence. So what's the answer to silence? Speech and openness. It was sustained by invisibility. If you're invisible, what's, what's the way to attack that? To become visible. Um, and it was not just a set of attitudes, but the closet was at the foundation of a kind of system of structural oppression. This was the idea of people, you know, in the Stonewall and post-Stonewall years, and they called it heterosexism, and it was a kind of system that was parallel to many other systems of social hierarchy that were being discussed at the time. You know, one that's obvious and is built into the term heterosexism is sexism, which was the idea that patriarchy, for example, was a superior way to organize families and societies. Heterosexism represented the, the idea that heterosexuality was so obviously superior and natural that maybe nothing else should even exist, or if something else did exist, it was definitely perverse and inferior. There were other systems of social hierarchy that were very much under discussion in 1969 and in the years leading up to that. The Civil Rights Movement addressed very directly a system of racial hierarchy, racism, that was maintained by a, a kind of commitment to white supremacy. These were all kind of social systems and not just, you know, kind of incorrect attitudes that you could um, change. So that was the analysis of the movement, I think, that was in this journalist of activity represented by silence equals death. And the main thing to do was to come out, to be public, visible, to speak, to tell one story, to kind of, to be in the light rather than in the shadows was the key central organizing principle of post uh, Stonewall um, activism. So, although coming out really, I mean the genius of coming out was that it attacked very directly the core of what gay people saw as the problem, namely the closet and the secrecy and shame that lived there, it also embedded in coming out is this kind of belief that making gay individuals just much more familiar and ordinary to the people around them, wherever those people happen to be, in their families, in their workplaces, in their communities, and so on, that doing that would necessarily diminish the kind of fear that animated homophobia. And in my view, I mean, from a point 50 years later, that, that pra very practical impact of coming out, the, the, of 
simply making, making it obvious that gay people were human beings, to put it very bluntly, that they belonged in every family, in every um, uh, workplace, in every city, and so on, has worked uh, brilliantly. That's not to say it has been 100% effective, but that strategy, um, which emerged out of that burst of rage at Stonewall, I think, has been um, at the heart of gay activism and politics ever, ever since. Um, the one thing, actually, before I do this, I wanted to say there was is that iconic moments like Stonewall really do matter. Otherwise, there wouldn't be all this fuss about the 50-year anniversary. But they, uh, and, and just to give you, but, the, but they also can um, kind of make it harder for us to see the patterns of, of, of sort of long-term constant effort by ordinary people on either side of those iconic moments to claim dignity and rights and autonomy and so on. And let me just give you a parallel example. Everybody, now, now knows about Rosa Parks and her refusal to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama in 1954. This is another iconic moment prior to Stonewall. What the, the genius of history is that that story is very important. And if you talk to any second grader or eighth grader or tenth grader, they will know more about Rosa Parks than, pra than practically anything else. So that that iconic moment has trickled down, and maybe in the future Stonewall, you know, will be just as familiar to second graders. I don't know that we're there yet, um, but we're on the way. But we think of Rosa Parks as that dignified woman who refused to give up her seat on the bus. What we actually know, thanks to the work of both community and professional historians, is that long before 1954, Rosa Parks was a very serious anti-rape investigator employed by the NAACP. And knowing that should change our view, not just of Rosa Parks, but of the civil rights movement and what it was about, um, that, that struggles for the sexual dignity of uh, African American women, for example, were central. We don't usually think of that. We think about segregation and Jim Crow, right? Those segregated buses in Montgomery and elsewhere. Um, in the same way as community and professional historians are, 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 are unearthing more of the history and stories that exist on either side of Stonewall, we will come to have a much richer and more complete understanding of, of the, the many sources of, of that movement, and in some ways, eventually, it may decenter, just like the Montgomery, you know, if, if we think about the civil rights movement as not just a movement for integration in the South, where there were Jim Crow laws, but as a movement that championed women's bodily integrity, we may, it'll decenter the Montgomery bus boycott, and that will happen, I predict, eventually, with Stonewall as well. So in light of that, let's just go back for a moment, and let me tell you just couple of quick things about the um, tireless effort of individuals who were not well known uh, by young people in 1969, who rioted outside of the Stonewall Inn, but who are the pioneers in many ways of gay rights. Um, here we have at, uh, at uh, the top on the right, Harry Hay, and these are, they're, they're, these are very small organizations compared to what we see after 1969, and they're called homophile organizations. They worked in a kind of McCarthy, in the McCarthy era, where which was very repressive in, in many ways of any kind of political uh, dissidence, and sort of sexual dissidence was often equated with communism and other forms of political subversion, so to be a pervert was to be a threat to national security. Um, they, there, there were parallels between those two, but in that kind of atmosphere, they worked um, for recognition, a kind of coming out in, in uh, a sort of polite 
um, uh, way, and uh, uh, they worked against uh, stigma and invisibility. So there were two organizations that are especially famous. One is the Mattachine Society, which is kind of the, um, let's see if we can get this. The, um, oh, no, <laughs> Carrie Hay was the founder of the Mattachine Society, and um, the kind of sister organization, the Daughters of Belitis, was founded in 1955 in San Francisco by these two women who were uh, lovers at the time, and then for decades after that, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin. And these organizations, um, you know, worked in a very different climate than post-Stonewall uh, gay activists. Um, their goals included building unity and community feeling of any kind among gay, gay men and lesbians. And that was sort of the sum total of the spectrum at the time, was gay men and lesbians. You know, the LG, the, the BT and the Q were not part, I mean, they, they were there, but they weren't part of the vocabulary. Um, they, they simply wanted to um, help gay men and lesbians feel less isolated and develop a sense of community and connections. That was one of their goals. They wanted to educate gay men and lesbians to become a kind of interest group in the, in the system of American pluralism, sort of analogous to what American Jews or Negroes, which was the word at the time, not African Americans. So they saw gay people, at least potentially, as a kind of interest group participating alongside others. They um, wanted to offer practical aid to individuals who were suffering the penalties of being gay, whether those penalties were criminal, medical, religious, familial, and so on. And those were the purposes of homophile organization. Um, let me just give you one more um, example, which is Frank Kameny, who's pictured here on the right, a very, very interesting individual. Um, I don't know if there's been a biography of him yet. There, there may have been, but there really should be. He was a World War II vet. He was kicked out of the military for being gay. This was not a unique experience. And that, that was really, really, you know, poison for one's career. Uh, there were serious consequences to being open and then being um, discharged from the military. Um, but he went, he went to Harvard, he got a PhD in astronomy, and he worked with the Ar Army Map Service until 1957 when he was fired for exactly the same reason, simply for being um, gay. And at this time, as I mentioned a moment ago, there was a kind of um, purge of workplaces, both public and private, an effort to purge homosexuals and sexual perverts from the American workplace that was very much in parallel um, and in concert with the purge of communists and other uh, political dissidents. And Fred Kennedy was certainly an example of that. His reaction, just like the reaction of the rioters at Stonewall, was not typical of gay workers who were fired from their jobs for being open or for being discovered. He began a crusade that lasted for decades to reform civil um, uh, civil service rules to put into place anti-discrimination language so that federal employees and others could not be fired simply for being uh, gay. And although it took a long time and it seemed glacial in its pace, in fact, Kameny's effort to uh, reform civil service rules was, in many ways, the one and only significant political victory for gay people in the workplace in the last four decades. Uh, the, with all the other advanced, people have focused on a lot of other changes and advances for good reasons, but in terms of workplace protections, there were and remain remarkably few. And so Frank Kameny, who was a pre-Stonewall activist, I think, um, can shed a lot of light on that. And let me just show you one more example of pre, this is the last example of pre-Stonewall. This was a 1967 um, 
demonstration in Philadelphia, so just a couple of years before Stonewall, but there were things like this in the early, uh, earlier in the 1960s as well. You can see how nicely everyone is dressed in suits and ties. No, I mean that in all seriousness. It's part of that strategy of presenting oneself as a respectable American citizen seeking inclusion. And I don't know if you can read, I'll read a couple of the signs um, for you. US claims no second class citizenship. What about homosexual citizens? So that effort to emphasize citizenship the American way of employment is based on competence, ability, training, not upon private life. So an effort to emphasize the similarities between gay people uh, as workers and as citizens and other Americans, not, not the distinction. And this, this, is, this along with their clothing um, choices, I think gives you a sense of the style of homophile activism and why people uh, like this, were so shocked um, by the rioters outside of the Stonewall Inn and called for kind of orderly conduct and um, and calm on the uh, streets of New York. Um, you know, it is in many ways an irony, I think, that now we're going beyond Stonewall to uh, uh, closer to the end of the 20th century, that both military service and marriage emerged as two core goals um, for gay activists. If you had asked uh, any of those rioters outside of the Stonewall Inn what it was they wanted, I promise you they would not have said either military <laughs> service or marriage, nor would you have gotten that response like in the 1970s or even well into the 80s. Those women had been together for 52 years at that point. 
And you can see, just by the expressions on the, the faces, how incredibly moving um, this was, not just for them, but for everyone around them. So, the sexual revolution, I think it's useful to conclude by thinking about Stonewall in relation to that. The sexual revolution did two, two really big and important things that, you know, some of these things, again, are so obvious to young people now, or, or they're getting to be very obvious, that it's very difficult for them to imagine a world where these things weren't true. The sexual revolution distinguished sex from gender, and these are just words that we use, but this, it essentially meant that um, uh, bodily realities and experiences of identity were not necessarily always consistent with each other. That sexual anatomy and the way one felt about mas being masculine or feminine, being gay or straight, were not the same thing, that these were quite different. And, and more than the difference between them, the real insight of the sexual, of you know, some of the architects of the sexual revolution is that even the biological facts, supposedly, the body and its anatomy are, um, are uh, you know, genetic um, uh, composition and so on. That even biological facts are socially organized. That biology is invested with cultural meaning, you know, what we mean by male or female. That we regulate bodies uh, with law and custom. And that Though that the way that these things are socially organized really changes a lot depending on where in the world you are and what moment you're looking at. This may seem like part of the air we breathe now. It was a revolutionary idea of the sexual revolution. And then, of course, the separation of, reproduct of reproduction and sexual behavior, most important not just for gay people, of course, but the contraceptive revolution. Of course, there's a long history to contraception, but the pill was approved by the FDA in 1960, so it's right in the mix in terms of the, the chronology. It made it possible to elevate sexual pleasure for heterosexuals as a value, as a very important value in marriage, and separate it from decisions about childbearing childbearing. And by implication, it also created space that the, 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 the um, new value placed on sexual pleasure as a, a life value created room to imagine gay uh, sexuality and gay experience. So, so Stonewall and everything related to it is connected uh, to the sexual revolution and then finally the rights a revolution, which we associate not just with Rosa Parks, but with many other, with the African American freedom struggle and many other movements among uh, Native Americans, among um, uh, many different groups in uh, American society during the 1950s and 60s. I would suggest that you know some of the some of the, the people and groups I told you about today illuminate fundamental challenges that the rights revolution has posed for American society and comes very close in many ways to the same kinds of questions when, uh, that appear when we think about uh, racial equality or equality between uh, men and women. And those questions have to do with what equality looks like and means in a society where there are social and cultural differences. And this is just back to the, you know, are gay people just citizens that have everything in common with every other type of American citizen, or are gay people distinctive in some ways? Of course, the answer is both, right? But it's the balance between those two and the choice of what you emphasize in an effort to make life better. Um, those, those are questions that gay activists share with um, uh, many other civil rights activists. Similarly, how can legal individualism, the idea that we are somehow independent individuals and in the eyes of the law, we are just ourselves individually, how do we reconcile that with the reality that people actually don't live day to day as completely autonomous individuals. We live as members of families and communities. Those families and communities have interests that are sometimes not the same as 
our individual interests. How do you do that? And where power is structured institutionally, not individually, and how do we achieve integration, that idea of inclusion, and living side by side, how do you achieve integration while respecting the value of personal freedom, the rights of individuals to be very different, if they choose to be that way, and the, the uh, rights of communities to, uh, to, um, you know, to be in charge of their own destinies, sometimes their, their own economic destinies, their own cultural destinies, and so on. And I just suggest that this <coughs> Fascinating and distinctive as it is, is also is important in its own right, and also because of its relationship to these other um, major themes in recent American history. And that's really all I have to say. So <laughs> I welcome you know any comments that you'd like to make about Stonewall. I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. <laughs> 